Hi there. You're listening to the Hellenistic Age Podcast. Episode 83, Hellenistic Literature, Apollonius of Rhodes and the Argonautica. When we last met, I gave an account of some of the most important poets working in Alexandria during the 3rd century BC, but neglected to name one last figure. Joining the vaunted ranks of Callimachus and Theocritus is a man named Apollonius of Rhodes. His most famous work, the Argonautica, is the only surviving Hellenistic epic, recounting the story of the hero Jason and the Argonauts as they pursue the Golden Fleece. While Homer and Virgil are the definitive authors of Greek and Latin epic poetry, Apollonius falls in the middle of these intellectual giants, his work often being viewed as a curious experiment bridging the gap between the two. In this episode, we will analyze the Argonautica, comparing and contrasting it with the works of Homer to see how Apollonius was able to challenge the traditional models of heroism and the epic, creating a poem which exemplified the characteristics of Alexandrian scholarship during this period. For this episode, I will be citing passages from the translation of Peter Green, published under University of California Press in 1997, and it contains a fair bit of useful supplementary materials that have aided my research and understanding. Starting from you, Phoebus, the deeds of those old-time mortals I shall relate, who by way of the Black Sea's mouth and through the cobalt-dark rocks, at King Peleus's commandment, in search of the Golden Fleece, drove tight-thwarted Argo. So begins the opening lines of the Argonautica, Apollonius's magnum opus and the only epic of the Hellenistic period to survive in its entirety. Arranged in four books in total and measuring out just under 6,000 lines, it is quite small in comparison to both the Odyssey and especially the Iliad, the latter being more than double the length of the Argonautica. The poem recounts the tale of the hero Jason and his crew of Argonauts, who sail upon their eponymous ship Argo into the Black Sea to retrieve the Golden Fleece, and in their journey they encountered famous figures like the witch Medea and many obstacles. Apollonius was not the first to put this story in written form. There are references to the voyage of the Argonauts in the Odyssey of Homer and Hesiod's Theogony, but a more thorough examination of Jason's story is also in the works of the poet Pindar and the Athenian playwright Euripides. The Argonautica is the most complete account, though, and forms the basis for the majority of later interpretations. But before we move forward, let us turn to the man of the hour, Apollonius of Rhodes. Despite his namesake, Apollonius was in fact born in Alexandria around 300 BC, his family belonging to the Ptolemais tribe. Little is known about his early life, but as a young adult, he became a pupil of the famed Callimachus in the 280s, and it was during this time he composed an early draft of the Argonautica and published it for his contemporaries to read. It seems that the literary elite were less than kind in their assessment of his work, so much so that Apollonius chose to abandon the city of his birth rather than continue to face the onslaught of negative criticism. There is a tradition of scholarship, based on a reference in the Byzantine Suda that suggests a quarrel took place between Apollonius and Callimachus over the reception of the first draft, resulting in Apollonius' self-imposed exile. Callimachus himself famously criticized epic poetry and the imitators of Homer, deeming them bloated works lacking subtlety, so this extrapolation may not be too far of a reach. Recent scholarship over the past 50 years has largely discredited this supposed argument, though, but it has not stopped people from speculating further on the connection between both men. Apollonius's next stop would be Rhodes, where he spent many years working as a respected teacher of rhetoric and refining the Argonautica. He was gifted Rhodian citizenship for his efforts, and the grateful poet chose to sign off his works as a Rhodian rather than an Alexandrian. Yet he would make his peace and return back home to Egypt in the 260s, as Ptolemy II offered him the lucrative post of royal tutor for the future Ptolemy III, along with the position of head librarian. He occupied this role for the next 20 years, eventually retiring around 246, and died some time afterwards. 
The publication of the Argonautica in its final form must have taken place during his time at Rhodes, as it was far better received in the Alexandrian circles, which presumably allowed him to claim the prestigious title in Ptolemy's library. With his background out of the way, a summary of the Argonautica is appropriate. Book 1 begins with the reason behind the expedition. King Peleus, ruler of Iolcus on the eastern shores of Greece, is informed of Apollo's prophecy foretelling his eventual demise at the hands of a man wearing a single sandal. Our hero Jason turns up to the royal feast one shoe short, due to his aid of the goddess Hera, who was disguised as an old woman. And so the king issues a quest for the hapless young man to sail north into the Black Sea and fetch the famed Golden Fleece, hidden somewhere in the far-off lands of Colchis, the modern state of Georgia and the Caucasus. Peleus intends it to be a suicide mission, but with the aid of the gods, Jason manages to receive his famed ship, the Argo, staffed with some of the most respected heroes in all of Greece, including the demigod Heracles, the twins Castor and Pollux, and Lyre playing Orpheus. With Jason elected as the leader of the Argonauts, the men depart Iolcus and sail away into the northern Aegean. The Argo makes a landing at the island of Lemnos, populated only by women who share an amorous encounter with the crew. As they then cross the Hellespont, the Argonauts face wild six-armed barbarians and accidentally involve themselves in a night attack that results in the death of a local king, while Heracles is left behind in Bithynia in search of his young ward. In Book 2, the Argo approaches the entrance of the Black Sea. Jason and the crew rescue the beleaguered King Phineas from his harassment by ravenous harpies, and as their reward, they are given the knowledge necessary to pass the formidable Simplegades, a pair of rocks at the mouth of the Bosphorus that smashes any ship that attempts to sail through. This information, along with the direct assistance of the goddess Athena, enables the Argo to cross without harm. Their travels along the southeastern shores of the Black Sea have them encounter local peoples like the Amazons, but some of the Argonauts are killed by the area's wildlife or die of disease. One island is heavily guarded by the vicious Stymphalian birds, who are attacking a shipwreck group of four brothers, but the winged monsters get driven off by the intervention of the Argonauts. These brothers are actually the descendants of King Aetes, ruler of Colchis and the Keeper of the Fleece, and in return, they join up with Jason and guide the heroes to the kingdom. The arrival of the Argo into Colchis marks the beginning of Book 3, with Jason advising diplomacy to acquire the fleece over open warfare. Instead of being happy at the safe return of his grandsons, King Aetes is livid at the idea of handing over his treasure to this interloper. In steps Jason, who tries to soothe his majesty's concerns and explains his god-given mission. Aetes is obliged to not kill them on the spot, but devises a series of tasks for Jason to undertake to claim his prize, much to our hero's dismay. The first is to plow the plain of Ares using a pair of fire-breathing oxen. The second is to use these fields to plant the teeth of a giant serpent, and the third is to slay the armored warriors that will erupt from the sown earth. Like Peleus, Aetes' tasks were suicidal, but little did the king know that both his family and the gods themselves were conspiring against him. On Mount Olympus, Hera and Athena work out a plan to ease Jason's trials by enlisting the aid of Aphrodite and her mischievous son, Eros. The target is to be Medea, Aetes' daughter and an accomplished sorceress, trained in magic by the goddess Hecate herself, and the poor girl falls madly in love with Jason once struck with Cupid's arrow. Medea is driven to a state of turmoil, torn in between remaining loyal to her father or helping Jason, to the point of where she considers ending her life. She instead decides to follow her heart, meeting with her beloved in secret to provide him the potions and knowledge necessary to best Aetes' trials. The book concludes with Jason successfully overcoming the labors with Medea's tricks and spells, leaving the king bewildered at his failure. In the fourth and final book, Medea flees from the palace to the Argonauts' camp, fearing her father's wrath for her aid of Jason and his plans to slay the heroes. She encourages them to steal the fleece, guarded by the aforementioned serpent, and for her help, Jason promises to marry and bring her back to Greece. The pair manage to snatch their prize after casting a sleeping spell on the fearsome snake, but could not bask in its golden aura for long, as Aetes and the Colchian navy were hot on their trail. 
Recalling an earlier prophecy, the Argonauts decide not to return through the Bosporus, instead choosing to sail into the mouth of the Danube River, which empties out from the western shores of the Black Sea. Their intended path was to cut through Central Europe and escape to Greece via the Adriatic, but just as they entered into what they deemed to be safe waters, it is revealed that half the Colchian navy lay in ambush. Led by Medea's brother, Prince Aspiritus, a truce was offered to the Argonauts. They may keep the fleece as per the terms of Jason's victory, but Medea must be handed over for judgment by a council made up of local kings acting as mediators, who would determine whether she must be brought back to Colchis or remain in Jason's protection. Medea herself was terrified at the prospects of facing punishment at the hands of her father, and begged her soon-to-be husband not to abandon her. The pair lured Aspiritus to a private meeting on the nearby sacred island of Artemis, and when the prince's guard was relaxed, Jason sprung from the shadows and ran him through with his sword. Though the Argonauts were freed from further harassment by the now leaderless Colchians, it turns out that committing murder of a blood relative under false pretenses on a sacred island was not really going to win them any favors. Largely off-screen, Zeus was furious at this betrayal, vowing that the Argonauts would not be able to return home until they absolved themselves of their crime by the magics of the sorceress, Circe. The heroes were forced to turn around and head northwards, once again pressed into sailing through Europe by way of the Po, Rhine, and Rhone rivers. This extended detour eventually led them to pass into the Sardinian Sea, allowing them to stop at Circe's island and perform the necessary rituals. After surviving the dangers of the enchanting sirens and violent wandering rocks along the coast of Italy, the Argo has finally reached back into the Adriatic Sea, only to discover that the second part of the Colchian fleet lay in wait off the shores of Corfu. The local king offered to mediate between the two parties, though his queen reveals to Jason and Medea that they intended on handing Medea back over to Aetes, that is, if she still remained a virgin. The pair decided to wed in a secret cave, consummating their marriage on top of the Golden Fleece, and the news of their union was enough to convince the Colchians to give up and stay behind rather than going back to Aetes empty-handed. After some celebrations, the Argonauts embark on what they believed to be their voyage homewards. Fate decreed that they were to face one more detour, and the winds blow them southwards all the way back to the Gulf of Sidra in Libya. Shipwrecked with little drinking water and the intolerable heat of the African sun, the Argo's crew became despondent and believed their doom was fast approaching. With the assistance of some local nymphs, the heroes carried the Argo across the sands of Libya for nearly 12 days, before reaching Lake Triton and the famed Garden of the Hesperides. There they find a fresh spring to quench their thirst, and the god Triton ferried their ship back into the Mediterranean. After a brief clash with Talos, the mechanical giant, the crew safely lands on the island of Aegina, marking the journey's end for the Argonauts, and Apollonius concludes his poem with the following passage, quote, Be gracious, my heroes, race of the blessed, and may these songs of mine year by year be sweeter for men to sing, for now I have reached the illustrious conclusion of your labors since there befell you no further adventures as you set sail from Aegina and continued their voyage. No storms, no tempests opposed you. Calmly you coasted past the Cacropian shore, and Aulus, in the channel beyond Euboea, and past the Apuntian cities of Locris, and joyfully stepped ashore on the beach at Pagasai. ways, the Argonautica is a deliberate callback to the works of Homer, yet also manages to encapsulate the changing literary standards of both the Alexandrian poets and the broader Hellenistic period. Like its predecessors, the lines are composed in dactylic hexameter, and Apollonius directly invokes the muses, signaling his intent to keep with the custom of the epics. The retelling of the Argonauts' voyage is rife with allusions to the older Homeric poems, in some of the earliest sections of Book 1, Apollonius recites a full list of all 55 crew members of the Argo, providing very brief biographies and motivations for joining the expedition. 
This bears an obvious similarity to the famous, or infamous, Catalog of the Ships in the Iliad, which is equally as long and onerous. A description of the rich mythological imagery on the cloak of Jason, known in Greek as an ekphrasis, is a parallel to Homer's own passage on the shield of Achilles. The Argonautica serves as a something of a prequel to the Iliad and Odyssey, as we find that many of the destinations and characters that Jason runs across are featured in those stories as well. For instance, the sorceress Circe would be later encountered by Odysseus, and the Argonauts also meet with Thetis, the mother of Achilles, who, according to Apollonius, was prophesied to be wed to Medea in Elysium upon their deaths. While these elements may pay homage to the traditional Greek epic, the differences between the Argonautica and earlier works tells us quite a bit about Apollonius' skills and overall intent. As we can recall from my previous episode, one of the defining traits of Alexandrian poetry during the Hellenistic period was the frequent appearance of ideological stories. These are essentially accounts of how things came to be, and like with the works of Callimachus, we find Apollonius dedicating several passages to exploring them whenever possible. In Book 2, we get a story about the origin of the Etesian winds, a phenomenon occurring every summer whereby the north winds steadily blow cool air throughout the Aegean Sea. Apollonius recounts a story involving a son of Apollo and his sacrifices to Zeus and the dog star Sirius as the reason for their existence, but these digressions often have little, if anything, to do directly with the journey of the Argonauts. They do provide context behind some locations, though, and are intended to tie elements of the poem together, something that I will elaborate further on in a little bit. In most Greek epic poetry, the gods have a very active part to play when it comes to affecting the narrative and the characters within them. The Iliad and Odyssey have the gods hold council meetings on Olympus to discuss the events of the story, or take a physical appearance on Earth to interact with the characters and aid them. They may also be the root cause of the hero's problems, such as Apollo inflicting pestilence among the Achaeans during the Trojan War, or Poseidon interfering with Odysseus's journey home to Ithaca. Divine intervention is a recurring feature in the Argonautica as well, but there are some key differences in presentation. Zeus, king of the gods and the supreme authority of the Pantheon, is mentioned but does not appear in any significant capacity. Instead, we have a main triad of divinities, Apollo, Athena, and Hera. They are not the only gods in the story of the Argonauts, but they are the most involved. It is Apollo's own prophecy that serves as the catalyst for the expedition, and we have his physical manifestation in Book 2, which leads to the naming of a local island. Hera and Athena have far more of a presence and impact on the course of the story compared to more distant Apollo. Athena's intervention prevents the Simplegades from smashing the Argo to bits, literally using her hands to move the ship away from the rocks, and Hera scares off the Colchian fleet with a lightning storm. These two also work together to come up with a plan to allow Jason to succeed in Aeetes' trials, leading to the manipulation of Medea. As a hero, the presentation of Jason differs significantly from his Homeric counterparts. Achilles and Odysseus are shown to be forceful decision-makers, whose actions directly dictate the course of their own stories. True, each character is deeply affected by fate or divine intervention, but we can see a sense of agency and competency in their respective fields. Achilles is the most skilled warrior, Odysseus is the most cunning, and the manifestation of these traits results in consequences both good and bad. Jason, on the other hand, is surprisingly passive, even bordering on the incompetent. Perhaps a better expression would be, out of his league. Jason is not a particularly great fighter, nor especially clever, and his command of the Argo was due to his bloodline rather than any special skill set. It's also worth mentioning that he did not originally volunteer for this position, and his limited ability as a leader is also called into question by the Argonauts during a handful of times. What few qualities Jason does possess are his good looks and his innate, or divinely given, capacity for charming the female sex. He manages to bed Hypsipyle of Lemnos in Book 1, a queen of an island whose women murdered all the local men. His most famous tryst is with the witch Medea, who fell in love with Jason and aided him in defiance of her father. When Medea shows a moment of hesitation in her plan, he immediately assesses the situation and manages to persuade her from leading his ship by using that same charm. 
There are other examples that reinforce the theme of sex and romance being central to his role as a hero. Going back to the parallel between Achilles' shield and Jason's cloak, there is a notable contrast. Achilles' shield exemplifies his role as a warrior, a divinely given gift to be used in his duel with Hector. By comparison, Jason puts on the cloak to enhance his appearance before consorting with Hypsipyle. He even goes so far as to use the Golden Fleece as a bedspread on his first night of lovemaking with newlywed Medea, a symbolic display of his amorous prowess over his long sought after prize. Jason's reputation as a seducer of women was enough for Dante to condemn him to the Eighth Circle of the Inferno, along with pimps and other deceivers of history. In a similar vein to the Homeric heroes, Jason too possesses an innate character flaw, but it seems to be the inverse. Both Achilles and Odysseus were afflicted by hubris, excessive pride, to some capacity or another, born from their tremendous skill and abilities. Jason, on the other hand, is not prideful at all, but is instead saddled with amekanos, helplessness. Critics have noted that Jason is gripped with a sense of powerlessness on a number of occasions in the story. When King Aetes presented the three trials that needed to be solved in order to acquire the Golden Fleece, Jason is rendered silent with the overwhelming burden laid before him, which Apollonius describes as follows, quote, So the king spoke, but Jason, eyes fixed on the ground before him, sat there speechless, unmoving, at this loss and crisis. Long he considered the problem, tried every angle, yet dared not boldly take up the challenge, so huge a task it seemed. End quote. Often, it is solely through the actions of others that Jason is able to accomplish his goals. In Book 1, Jason's authority as leader of the Argo is only reinforced by the support of Heracles, which sets the tone of the work in many ways. More obvious is the fact that it is not through his own bravery or cunning that allows Jason to overcome the trials of Aetes, the problems are instead solved by Medea and her magic. Even accounting for his powers of seduction, Medea only falls in love with him because of the direct intervention of Hera, Athena, Aphrodite, and Eros, thus making the labors far easier to complete. The prominence of female characters, both human and divine, and the extent to which they assist Jason in his quest, differs quite a bit from the heroes of Homer or the other Argonauts, who were more traditionally masculine. Edas, an Argonaut who is more in line with the Homeric ideal, scoffs at the idea of relying on a woman's help when Jason explains Medea's plans to beat Aetes' trials. On the whole, Jason does not strike one as an especially impressive figure when compared to the many other heroes of Greco-Roman mythology, even within the context of his own story. Perhaps, though, this is precisely what Apollonius intended. It has been argued that the characterization of Jason explicitly flies in the face of the traditional hero archetype, and the result is a dynamic and complex character in his own right. There are many Argonauts in the tale who can point to a divine ancestry or their skill as great warriors, traits typically found in the Homeric heroes. Though he does possess royal blood, Jason is just a man, with no feats to his name. His most frequently used weapon was not a sword or a spear, but diplomacy. When the Argonauts encounter a potentially hostile opponent, Jason tries to de-escalate the situation as best as he can. This is often shown to be the correct course of action. When King Aetes threatens the expedition with death and disfigurement, the Homeric Telamon nearly bursts a blood vessel out of indignation. Before Telamon gets the outnumbered Argonauts killed with his impending outburst, Jason quickly steps in as the voice of reason to steer Aetes towards a less bluntly malevolent action. This contrast in behavior is consciously acknowledged by Apollonius, who sets Jason apart from his own crew in both personality and action. During the election of the expedition's leader, the Argonauts universally vote that Heracles take command. The demigod passes on the offer, arguing instead that it should go to Jason, perhaps a signal from Apollonius that the traditional hero is not what this story requires. Though he is the greatest warrior of the bunch, Heracles is shown to be something of a dumb brute, and is quickly removed from the story as he searches for his missing ward. The aforementioned Telamon and Edas are prime examples of how the older model of warrior hero was not the ideal fit for the job, given their quick tempers and foolish bravado. As the captain of the ship, 
Jason seems to genuinely care about his men, and does display signs of sorrow and regret if they are killed or lost in the process. His ability as a diplomat and willingness to accept help from unorthodox sources do also end up being the deciding factors that enable his ultimate victory. The passage I cited earlier about Jason's stunned silence in response to the task of Aetes may seem to portray him as a coward. It is hard to imagine Heracles or Achilles being dismayed by the challenge, but it is a completely reasonable reaction of an average person faced with similar prospects. By virtue of his abilities and in spite of his realistic shortcomings, he did manage to acquire the Golden Fleece, which is arguably more of an impressive feat than if performed by someone with superhuman abilities. It may also be too far to write off Jason as an utterly incapable but well-intentioned hero figure either. We cannot also fail to recognize that Jason is either deeply pragmatic or downright ruthless in his efforts to secure the fleece. His reputation with Medea is that of a one-sided infatuation. He does not love Medea, but willingly uses her divinely bestowed befuddlement to achieve his ends. At his worst, Jason manipulates her into participating in the murder of her brother Aspiritus, an act that is explicitly described as treacherous and downright sacrilegious. This rather twisted series of events would eventually lead to tragic consequences, as demonstrated in Euripides' play, Medea. When comparing the two traditions, Apollonius' portrayal of Medea paints her as far more of a victim than that of Euripides. Books 3 and 4 dedicate several passages to describing the extent of her inner turmoil, the actions of Eros causing a great amount of mental anguish as she wavers between guilt and fear. It appears to drive her to the point of insanity, threatening suicide on a number of occasions when she felt, correctly or otherwise, that Jason was considering abandoning her. The Argonautica was a byproduct of Alexandrian scholarship, and by extension, the patronage of the Ptolemies. It is worth investigating what sort of ties does the poem have with the aims of the Ptolemaic dynasty. Apollonius' geographical layout of Jason's travels is quite important. The crew sails from Greece into the Black Sea, Central Europe, the Adriatic, Italy, and North Africa. In some sense, the Argo and the Argonauts may be seen as the best and brightest of Greece, carrying civilization to often hostile and wild lands. Within the various ideological digressions and itinerary of the Argo's voyage, Jason and his crew encounter a large number of sites that would eventually become Greek colonies. The most exceptional example takes place at the very end of the story, when the Argonauts are in Libya. Before they depart on the last leg of their voyage, one hero named Euphemus is given a clod of earth by the god Triton, which he keeps close to his heart. As they approach Greece once again, Euphemus has a dream where the piece of earth is being nursed by his breast, before morphing into a woman with whom he makes love. She is revealed to be Caliste, a daughter of Triton and a literal piece of Libya itself, asking Euphemus to place her in the sea when he awakes. Once he honors this request, the sunken clod turns into a great island that rises from the waters, the future Thera or Santorini. This rather bizarre section is functionally the final episode of the poem, and must be significant enough for Apollonius to make it so. Many authors of antiquity attribute Euphemus as the mythical ancestor of the Thoraeans, who would send their own expedition to Libya and found the city of Kyrene, the first major Greek colony of Africa. This is important for the Ptolemaic worldview. Apollonius' foreshadowing of the Greek colonization of Africa is explicitly linked to the later colonization of Egypt following Alexander's conquests, and plays into the notion of bringing Greek culture abroad. Greece may certainly be the central location around which everything ties back to in the story, but Apollonius may be attempting to show the transfer of civilization into Ptolemaic Alexandria, the wellspring of art and literature that, in their eyes, replaced Athens as the new epicenter of the Greek world. The final published version of the Argonautica was a smash hit in Alexandria and beyond. As I've mentioned in previous episodes, Virgil explicitly drew upon Alexandrian poets like Theocritus as models for his own work, and it appears that Apollonius was an inspiring figure as well. While the Aeneid is said to be Virgil's answer to the Iliad and Odyssey, 
There are many elements to the story and its structure that are paralleled with that of the Argonautica. Aeneas's characterization as a hero contains echoes of Jason, and the tragic romance of Jason and Medea may have served as the inspiration of the similarly ruinous relationship between Aeneas and Queen Dido of Carthage. The poem's survival into the modern period with relatively little debates on its composition is a testament to its consistent popularity throughout antiquity. Fragments of the work have been discovered in Egyptian papyri ranging from the 1st century BC to the 5th century AD, and over 50 manuscripts are attributed to the High and Late Middle Ages, most coming out of Constantinople and brought over to Italy during the Renaissance, which would explain Dante's familiarity with it. As we move closer to the modern period, the Argonautica has suffered a drop in appreciation when compared to Homer or Virgil, who remain part of the core curriculum for much of Europe and North America to the present day. Some of this can be attributed to the portrayal of Jason as a sort of anti-hero, but Apollonius's reinvention of the Homeric epic has been increasingly acknowledged as a hallmark of Greek literature, worthy of its position alongside the Iliad, Odyssey, and Aeneid. With our discussion of Apollonius at an end, so too does our series on Hellenistic literature as well. Now, by no means is this a complete account, as I have neglected to discuss the likes of Lycophoron, Nicander, Herodas, Irina, and others. My intention was to give you a general survey of the most important authors and genres that developed in this period. And if we include my earlier episode on Polybius and his histories, I believe that this is a reasonably well-rounded introduction to a topic which I've tried to avoid becoming bogged down in. As such, if you are looking to get a more in-depth discussion, then I do encourage you to check out the bibliographies for each of these past episodes. Of these many books I used in my research, I found Catherine Gutzwiller's A Guide to Hellenistic Literature to be a great launching point that covers all the bases while remaining concise, so I would highly recommend you start from there as well. While I still have your attention, let me also provide you my plans regarding the direction of the podcast. Starting next episode, and lasting almost the entirety of 2023, we will be sticking to the overall narrative as we reach a critical turning point of the show, the Roman entrance into the Hellenistic East. From the Republic's campaigns in Illyria until the war against Antiochus III, this is a period of nearly 50 years that will command considerable time and attention, and I have no realistic expectations of how many episodes this will require. Besides that, I have other content planned as well. I had a great time in Rome and Naples last September, and soon I will be making my way to Greece in just under two weeks' time, where I will spend my vacation in Athens and the Peloponnese. Given the obvious relevance of destinations like Athens, Corinth, and Delphi to the podcast, I will try my hand at creating video content that can act as visual aids to supplement what we've already done in the show, or as interesting pieces in of themselves. I'm not quite sure how it will turn out, but it ought to be a fun little side project. Coincidentally, the next episode will be releasing the same day I leave, and when I return, I will publish my interview with Dr. Brett Devereaux on the Roman Republic at War. I thank you all for taking the time to listen, and until we next meet, you've been listening to the Hellenistic Age Podcast. <laughs>